choir's anthem and the kids and you guys singing. This is good. This is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And on one day, human history passed this how it was. Um, I want to pray to our Savior, and then I'm going to open up and let him speak for himself through John 13. Let me pray first. Jesus, it's not hard to praise you when it's Palm Sunday. We know historically this was a really powerful day. We know that the, the, the streets were lined with people who were adoring you. We know that the kids were there, like they do up at parades, just excited and, and yelling Hosanna and waving palm branches. We thank you that on this day in human history, your, your name received the praise that you deserve. But Lord, we don't want to make the mistake that humans did 2,000 years ago, where within a week that roaring crowd becomes a crowd that says crucified. We don't want to be part of that. The truth is, we are. I thank you for who you are, and that though you know we will reject you, you still volunteer to be our Redeemer and our Savior. And you serve us and you wash our feet, both figuratively and literally, and you call us into a relationship with you. Will you help us to see in your words, not in mine, what redemption is really about this morning? I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Ah, uh, confession. I had four hamburgers this week. I mean, my quest has become my own as a dietary obsession, and it's starting to make a list of places where I've been during Lent. Some people give things up for Lent, apparently not me. Uh, I think I gave up fish, you know? I have been to Cane's twice. I've been to Slider's Tavern, I've been to the 571 Draft House, I've been to Longhorn Steakhouse, I've been to O'Charles. I've been to BJ's at Austin Landing, I've been to Wendy's, and I've been to McDonald's, if those last two actually count as hamburgers. And my latest addition to my hamburger obsession, because I'm trying to find the best hamburger in the area, my latest addition was Harrison's yesterday afternoon about 4.30 while people in prom where we're crawling all over Tip City. Um, how many of you have been to Harrison's over in Tip? Oh good, so I'm, I'm speaking a language you understand. I'm pretty good experience. You, you know, I'm looking at the decor, the french fries, and the burger. Decor, I like old authentic. I don't like fake authentic. I mean, fake uh, old. I don't like it when they put the 18 inch, 18th of an inch brick up on the wall and throw it. No, 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 no. Harrison's is a hundred and something year old building. And the exposed brick is the original brick from the building. It is beautiful decor. And on the walls are, are these huge photographs of the way it was back in the horsey bug and the uh, horse and buggy era. And then I think I was supposed to be born into and living. I really like that era. Um, the fries were hot. They were the best fries I've ever had. But they were hot. That's a good thing. And they weren't soggy. And the burger. Mm -hmm. Well, when I looked at it, I could tell it was going to be better instead of worse because it wasn't perfectly round, made by a machine. It was a hand patty burger, and it was thick enough, and it was cooked to order. And then the vegetables they put on it, the onions sliced oh so thin, and the tomato was like real, like not like a hothouse tomato. And the pickles were good, and it was a good experience. So on my scale of uh, 1 to 30, it gets a 17 out of 30. The real question is, will I go back? And the answer is yes, yeah, sometime, but there are so many good burgers around to have. I don't know if it's going to be something I go back to anytime soon. I've figured this out about my scale. It's easy to make one separation from the Wendy's and McDonald's to the K's and the Longhorns and the Harrison's. That's a pretty easy division to make. From the perfectly round to the hand padding, that's a pretty easy division to make. From fast food to a real restaurant. But once you're in the real restaurant, here's what I'm discovering. Making a really good burger that begs me to come back before I'm done getting everybody else evaluated, I think it's a little harder than I ever imagined. Because people can get above the Wendy's line and just be in the restaurant line. It's like, yeah, I don't know if I'm coming back anytime soon because there are others that are so great. This must be a harder game than I ever imagined. All right, so during Lent, I'm not only trying to find the best burger, I think that's just an excuse to eat a lot. I think the other thing is, I'm, I'm driven by the concept of, I want to have a burger with Jesus. 
I want to sit three feet across the table with Jesus, not in a sanctuary, not with a tie-on. I just want to sit down and have a conversation with the Lord Jesus, get to know how he thinks, watch how he treats other people, listen in on conversation. So as I've been reading um, my, in my personal devotions, I've been reading just the Gospels during Lent, and I'm back in John chapter 13 this morning, if, if you have a copy of the New Testament. John chapter 13, Jesus is having the last meal before he surrenders his life on the cross, what will be um, Friday this week. It is the last meal um, that Jesus has. He's having Passover with, the Passover with his disciples, and we looked at the situation last week, but we didn't read any of the conversation. We just watched what Jesus did. And what Jesus does on that night um, 2,000 years ago is he's in the middle of dinner and he looks around and he realizes they didn't do a basic. They didn't wash feet. And so Jesus hasn't spoken yet in John chapter 13, but he gets up and he washes the feet of 12 men. One man is a man that within hours will betray him. One man is a man who, though he will swear loyalty by tomorrow morning, he will deny Jesus three times. And everybody else is in that big group of people who will abandon Jesus at his most important day of need. And yet Jesus, knowing all that, he washes their feet anyway. That's what he does. This morning I want to listen to what he says. If you have your Bibles, um, John chapter 13, we're going to pick it up at verse 2, and we're going to go down through a little bit of the conversation. Verse 2. The evening meal was being prepared, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath and he's only washed his feet, his whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There are, there are, there are so many things in what Jesus just said, but there are two that jumped out of me. And they are two that have a common word, two different sentences that have a common word. I think this is interesting. If you look at verse 7, when Jesus is starting to wash the disciples' feet, of course it's Peter who says, uh-uh, you aren't doing this. Everybody else was apparently lets it, lets it happen. But not Peter. Peter just speaks up and goes, Lord, there is no way the rabbi is washing my feet. That isn't going to happen. And Jesus says to him, verse 7, you don't realize now what I'm doing. But later you will understand. Later you will understand. Later you will understand. You don't catch this, but later you're going to catch this. Now we'll let the rest go down to verse 12. After the foot washing is done, Jesus goes back to the table and gets back in dinner garb. And then it says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on and returned to the place. Do you understand what I have done to you? Do you understand? He just told Peter ten minutes before. You'll understand this later. You don't understand this yet. And then ten minutes after it's all over, ten minutes later, Jesus says, do you understand what just happened here? Isn't that interesting that Jesus says that same word twice? Um, can I ask you a question? Do you guys understand what Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet? 
He washed the disciples' feet, okay? We're talking about a culture where it's very dusty in that part of the world. And we're talking about a culture where raw sewage flowed right down the middle of the, the streets of the village. That's just how it is in that time period. And so when you were just out and about, walking in sandaled feet, your feet just get covered in dust all the time. And it's filthy. I mean, it's disgusting dust. Because it's mixing with what's flowing through the streets. So it was like, um, like when you do yard work and you come in um, from the yard to the house, what do you do? You wipe your feet. Okay, only times, times ten, right? Because they're sandal feet and dust and the muck of the, the sewage. And Jesus is just satisfying a, a base human need. I mean, this is low-level base human need. He was washing off the filth of daily life. And don't, don't let the metaphorical on us, okay? This filth is not symbolic of the sin of the lives. <coughs> the filth is dust and urine because of the, the place where they live. It's just he's washing it off. Oh, is this symbolic of the sinful choices they made? No, it's symbolic of the fact that they live in the first century in a part of the world where it's very dusty and they have sewage running down the middle of the road. I don't care if you're righteous or wicked. I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care if you are blessed or disadvantaged. You get dirty feet in the first century walking around with sandals given the situation. And what does Jesus do? He meets a very base human need. I don't walk around in sandals. I like shoes because I trip on stuff and I don't like stubbing my toe, right? So I tend to wear shoes even when I'm at my house. I like almost wear them to bed because there's the, the bed thing that I trip on, right? So that's not going to be, um, washing feet isn't going to be a basic human need for me. What are the basic human needs that everybody, rich or poor, righteous or wicked, has to deal with on a daily basis? Think about it. A few weeks ago, and we do this multiple times a year, we have a paper drive at the church, and we're not doing it like we did back in the 70s when it's newspapers, right? No, we're talking about toilet paper. And I don't want to be crude or crass, but I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care if you're righteous or wicked. You need toilet paper. It's a base human need. And what do we do? We collect toilet paper and we give it away. That's the equivalent of washing feet. Um, a couple of times a year, um, Judy um, makes, makes, uh, gets a group of ladies together and they make lunch for the folks over at Mariah's Technologies. Why? Because food is a base human need. All of us need it multiple times a day. We need food. So we wash feet. We give food to people. We invite the city workers in and we give food to them. Base human need, when people are hurting, you comfort them. When they are lonely, you give them company. When they are struggling, you give them encouragement. When they are grieving, boy, do we like do carrying dinners around here. We're washing feet for people. Not literally. We're doing a thing with me. We're meeting base human needs. But here's what is required for Jesus to pull this off this night. They're in the middle of a meal. And Jesus notices that they haven't met this base human need. He notices. And, and, and once he notices, hey, your feet are dirty because you walk around in the first century on dirt roads, they have sewage running down the street. And we're sitting at dinner. This is disgusting. We need to take care of this. And Jesus interrupts his meal. And he washes their feet. It's not a hard thing to understand, is it? It's a real basic thing to understand. But Jesus asks them the question in verse 12. Do you understand what I've just done for you? There are a lot of things in theology that I find very difficult to understand. Though the word Trinity does not appear in the scriptures, we believe in the theology of the Trinity. That there is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But He's only one. But there are three. No, there's one. There's one God, He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there are times in scripture where Jesus will say, Father, I'm addressing Father. Well, wait, wait, if there's one, is He talking to Himself? I don't really get that. 
And there are times when Jesus says, I don't want to proceed with this redemption plan. Nevertheless, not my will, but the Father's will. We can boy, if there's two different wills, how can there not be two different gods? No, no, no. It's one God, but it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit inside of God. So we come up with human ways to understand this thing. Have you ever heard this one? It's kind of like an egg. Is this an egg? Well, no, this is an Easter egg. Okay, you're going to have to go with me here. Is this an egg? Yes, yeah, an egg. If I crack this open, what do I have? I have the egg yolk. I have the egg white, and I have the egg shell. But it's one egg. Okay, so that kind of works. It's all one egg, right? But I've never known an egg yolk to talk to an egg shell, or an egg white to have a will that tells the egg yolk or the egg shell what to do, or for the egg yolk to submit to the will of the egg. Okay, so this isn't going to work, is it? We do the, uh, the, the water H2O thing. It's H2O. It's U2 hydrogen and oxygen, right? That's what it is, right? Yeah, but if it's hot enough, it can be steam, and if it's not hot enough, it can be water, and if it's too, uh, too cold, then it's ice. It's all H2O. It's all one thing, but it's three things. Again, I've never seen water talk to steam. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work. That's a theology that's hard to understand. Jesus washed their feet. He met a base human need for these guys. That's all he did, right? Because their feet are dirty with literal dust, not unrighteousness, just literal dust. And Jesus washed their feet. That's not hard to understand. Here's another one that I think is hard to understand. Did you decide to come to church today as an act of your free will, or, or was it predestination that God predestined that on this day and time, you would get up, get showered, get dressed, and come to church? It's not your will that's operating, it's your predestined behavior. Oh my, a couple of you are smiling because you know what I'm talking about. This is a huge argument in, in theology. I, I don't know. I think I got up on my own today, but I'm not sure. How about this one? Did you hear this story about the little, the little kid in uh, Minnesota this week that fell in the mall? And the early reports of the story I've heard an update is that somebody actually picked him up and threw him over. Total stranger. Doesn't know the family is not malicious, just mean spirited. Threw a kid three stories down. I heard yesterday he was in critical condition. Why? Why do bad things happen to good people is a tough theology. And if you get the answer to that, we'll go ahead and write a book. I'll buy it. I'll be your first copy if you can really answer why do bad things happen to good people. It's a hard one. How, how about this one? How can God, who's all-powerful and all-loving, all at the same time, allow Satan to have so much leash in our world to enact the evil that is constant every day? Those are hard theologies. Do you understand those? But this one is not hard theology. Do you understand what I just did, Jesus asked? Do you understand this? Peter, 10 minutes ago, you didn't understand. And, and now you understand. Do you understand this? It's not hard to understand. I mean, if you look at verses 13 through 16, do you understand this? Jesus says, you call me teacher, and that's what I am, and I just washed your feet. Do you understand that? Well, he's the teacher. And he just washed, washed his students' feet. Kind of understand that one. Do you understand this one? Now that I've washed your feet, you should wash everybody else's feet. Do you understand what that means? It means go get a bucket of water and arrive and start washing people's feet. But notice, none of the disciples ran to get the basin of water right then because they all knew their feet were clean. They, they put it in their day book. Next time this situation happens, i got to do this. I get it. That's not hard to understand. It's not hard to understand when Jesus says, verse 15, I set an example for you. You should do like I just did. Check. Got it. And it's not hard to understand how Jesus almost ends his little conversation. He says, no servant is greater than his master. No doubt. The employer is over the employee. That's how it works in the world. That's not hard to understand. This theology is not hard to understand. But it's hard to do. Because here's what it's going to require. It might require that you interrupt what you're doing right now, right in the middle of dinner, and stop eating and get up and put on a towel and go serve somebody. It, it, it might mean 
that you have to do something in servitude that is totally beneath your job description. Last week I was having a hamburger with a couple of friends after work. And Linda and I were sitting on this side and Candy and Randy are sitting on this side and we're talking about work. And Candy is, um, she's the high school secretary at Dane Christian. She's Linda's direct boss. And Candy has a bad habit of picking up every fumbled ball in the corporation and fixing things. And she was a little frustrated about that. And I said, Candy, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're not going to like this advice, but I'm going to give you some advice. Sometimes you need to let the fumbled ball be fumbled. Because then somebody else will see that it's a fumbled ball and they'll go, gosh, what just happened there? Who's not doing their job? I need to do that because it's my job or it's in my department. I've got two people out there that are nodding with me and one of them is like CFO level, right? This is good leadership advice, isn't it? Sometimes you have to let the fumble ball lie. But that's not what Jesus did. In this situation, Jesus isn't the servant, he's the teacher. And he became the servant and did the servant's job because it was a fumbled ball and Jesus could meet the need. Might be good leadership advice, but it's not good Jesus advice. This is not what Jesus did. One of the realities of my desire to have um, a hamburger with Jesus is, while I was having a hamburger in this passage, Jesus just said, Greg, you and I think completely differently. You think like a leader. I think like a savior. I was like, oh my goodness, I just had a hamburger with Jesus. So this morning we have breakfast. Um, I've got to change the script, Maria. Thank you for this example. You didn't even know you were one. I have in my notes what I was going to say, now I'm going to change it. So we're downstairs having breakfast, and I'm doing what I do best, eating and talking. <laughs> And as we're all done at my table, Maria gets up and she takes her plate to the kitchen, to the trash can, and then gets her husband's, then mine, and everybody else at the table. Then she came back and <laughs> I wanted to say, are you still talking, Greg? And she just clears the table. Do you need anything else? Do you want more coffee? She was doing what Jesus does. She saw basic human needs, and she met basic human needs. Jesus says to his disciples, do you understand this? Do you understand what just happened? A person in the congregation just served other people in the congregation, not because it's her job, but it's because what Christ followers do. This isn't hard to understand, is it? It's just hard to do because you have to stop talking and stop eating and look around and say, what are the base human needs that are being met here? And I think I'm going to interrupt my agenda right now. I think I'm going to start meeting those base human needs. For us, it's not difficult. Not to understand. It's just hard to do. Because we don't stop talking long enough to notice. Jesus says to his disciples, do you understand? That's not the last thing he says to them in this paragraph. Look at verse 17. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. And blessed there means you'll be the envy of everybody around you because you'll get it. That's what the blessing is. You'll get it because you do it. May God add his blessing to the reading and explanation of this word. Let me add a, um, a prayer request to your list that's already in your bulletin. 